Life of Fred, Financial Choices. Chapter 28, Brain Games. The human brain is the most complicated thing in the universe. Understanding algebra or chemistry is much easier than figuring out that three-pound mass of jellied pudding that sits between your ears. Most newborn babies are a body with a brain attached. Fred was a brain with an attached body. He used his body to carry around his brain. When he was a day or two old, he was trying to explain to his mother what a function is. You start with two sets, A and B. A function is any rule which assigns to each element of A exactly one element of B. If A is the set of nickels in my pockets and B is the set of numbers, one possible function assigns each nickel to the year stamped on the coin. Another possible function assigns nickels in my left pocket to 398 and nickels in my right pocket to 935,1218. Yet with all that brain power, he could never understand why he failed to do things he knew he should do and did things that he shouldn't. It just might be impossible for a brain to understand itself. I'm not sure. Fred heard many stories from English and history teachers who would assign 15-page papers. They told Fred tales of students who would stay up all night writing their papers at the very last moment. The students knew months ahead when the paper was due. Staying up all night was painful, but many of them habitually wrote their papers this way. These last minute papers were usually horrible messes, and yet they did it. Were those students hoping to die before the paper was due? Were they hoping the teacher would change the due date or cancel the paper? Some people put off going to the dentist for years until their teeth hurt so bad that they can't stand it. It would have been much more pleasant to have that little cavity filled a couple of years earlier. 99% <clears throat> practice putting off things. Putting off having kids until you are 55 has some real drawbacks. Excuses Excuses, 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 dot, dot, dot. Question. Suppose you plan on dying five years from now. Wouldn't that be a great excuse for not beginning the 24 years to retirement? Answer. Hardly. If you were start, if you were to start that planting in a circle and only did five years worth and pass that along to your child, that would mean that you would be making your child's retirement come five years earlier. A gift of five years. What a gift. Procrastination is only one of the games that your mind likes to play. There are many others. There is the staying healthy game. Suppose there are two weeks till your hundredth birthday. A big celebration is planned. There is a major connection between mind and body. Your mind tells your body to stay alive for those two weeks. Many more people die in the two weeks after their big party than in the two weeks beforehand. Lots are sick in bed on the day of a final exam that they dread. Few are sick on the days they are starring in a school play. There is the windfall game. You are in the attic going through a bunch of stuff that your aunt left when she died several years ago. 
you find $450 in one of her old purses. You call up your friends and take them all out to a fancy dinner. You buy the whole collection of music CDs of your favorite singing cowboy. It is found money, a windfall. <clears throat> Instead, you get your monthly check. With the recent raise, it's now 540 more than it used to be. It's earned money, not found money. You save or invest it. This is a brain game. In reality, the $540 is $540, regardless of how you received it. It should all go into the pot marked income, but that is not how many people operate. People who win a $100,000 lottery, money they haven't spent years working hard to accumulate, go on spending sprees. It doesn't take long for them to be back at the place they were before they got the windfall. There is the falling in love game. You see him or her across a crowded room. It's love at first sight. Your brain automatically fills in every good trait for that person. They have no body odor. They sing on key. They don't have a big ugly tattoo on their back. They aren't married. Your brain never seems to fill in the unseen details with just average qualities. Hemorrhoids and haphophobia, which is an abnormal fear of being touched, never enter your mind. <clears throat> there is the let's, it's free game. Our brains are hardwired to respond irrationally to anything that's marked free. We almost can't help ourselves. If chocolate cakes are on sale for 10 cents, we'll buy a dozen of them. If they are marked free, we'll fill up our car trunk with them. Have you ever been to conferences or home shows that offer free key rings, pencils, and refrigerator magnets? You'll fill up your shopping bag with them and throw them away when you get home. But if they cost a penny each, you wouldn't touch them. <clears throat> the price of Fred's books. For years, several of my friends have told me I should increase the price of the Life of Fred books. They pointed out that my Life of Fred Calculus Expanded Edition book, which covers all two years of college calculus, is only $49. There is nothing comparable on in the market for under $150. I told them that I wanted to keep the prices really cheap. I wasn't wanting writing. I wasn't writing to make a buck. They smiled and said, "Okay, double the prices and offer buy one and get one free. People will love it." Lots of stores do that. I don't want to do that. Chapter 29, A Checklist. Kingy got interrupted again. A couple of times a day, the armored truck would roll up to the math building. An armed guard would climb the stairs and present Kingy with another suitcase of money from his painting sales. Kingy would stop painting and wipe his hands. He would take the suitcase into his fort and drag it up to the third floor where his 17 safes are. When you are only six inches tall, you drag a suitcase, not carry it. The safes were completely full, so Kingy just stacked the suitcases against a wall. He pulled a couple hundred dollar bills out of a suitcase so that he could buy more painting supplies. Then he could get back to his passion, which was oil painting. The wealth came as a byproduct. When you are one of the best one or two hundred in the world, in almost any field, money will come almost automatically. 
Fred was one month into his quest to found a university. Of the seven ways to get startup capital, win, inherit, marry, steal, partner, earn, and borrow. He knew that only earning and borrowing were reasonable. He needed $120,000. In this month, he had tried seven different businesses that required very little capital to start. None of them had worked. Tomorrow, classes would start. Teaching would take a small chunk out of his day, eight till five, with a five-minute break at three. He knew that he would keep reading books about founding a university and would try other low capital to start businesses. No bank would lend to him. None of his students had $120,000. He knew that he would have to earn the startup capital since he couldn't find a lender. It would be another three or four months before the obvious source of funding would dawn on, on Fred. In case you need a hint, please reread the first two paragraphs of this chapter. Classes for the fall semester this year started on Wednesday. Today, Tuesday, students and faculty were settling in. Many of them had spent the summer in idleness. Fred often wondered how the students would do if they had to retake today the final exams they took at the end of the previous spring semester. The studies have been done. Most students would flunk the exam. Helen was busy meeting other faculty members and showing off her Hawaiian tan. She invited them to come see how she had decorated her office. Out of curiosity, many of them came and looked and left. They were unimpressed by her extravagance and thought that she was just a rich young kid trying to show off, knowing that no teacher could afford new furniture and a fireplace on the salary that kittens paid. Fred was trying to get as much reading done as he could on this last day before classes. He was deep into Professor Ed Eldwood's checklist of personal habits for success. He had just finished the chapter entitled, Don't Show Off. Eldwood wrote that most kids learn by the time that they are teenagers that showing off and bragging does not win friends. It breeds envy. Others will feel resentment when you talk about having stuff that they can't have. If you invited Kingy out to lunch, he would talk about a thousand aspects of painting. Great artists, new oil painting techniques, abstract art versus photorealism, and so on. He would never mention all the money that was piling up in his fort. The role is simple. If you're a success, zip the lip. I, your reader, have a small question. Does that mean I'm only supposed to talk about my failures? Professor Eldwood also writes about that in his Don't Show Off chapter. He asks you to think about what your reaction would be if someone tells you, my cat died last week, my car is turning into a cash eater. Last week, I had to spend $2,300 on a front-end alignment, and now the brakes are going. My landlord won't replace my old refrigerator. I lost my job yesterday because my boss didn't like my attitude. My stomach has been real sour lately. I hope it isn't cancer. I'm terrified of what next month is going to bring. Other than a little schadenfreude, you wouldn't want to listen to much of that failure talk either. But this doesn't make sense. I need to know. If I can't talk about my super successes and I can't talk about my misfortunes, what's left? My, me, I, mine, my, I, my. Do you see a little pattern here or there? It might be that only your mother, when she's not too busy, 
wants to hear about you. On the first date, you don't brag about yourself and you don't bemoan your many shortcomings. They want to know who you are. They want to know if they want to go on a second date with you. Talk a bit about what interests you, what your major was in college, who you admire, your hobbies, but keep it short. If your hobby is making popcorn, don't spend a half hour talking about the four different methods of popping the corn and 15 different recipes for caramelizing it. If you bore the socks off of him or her on the first date, he or she surely won't want to spend the rest of their lives with you and your popcorn. On about the third date, it's appropriate to disclose that you are an alcoholic, that early onset dementia runs in your family, etc. Keeping those things secret until you are engaged is really unfair to the other person. Professor Eldwood's Checklist of Personal Habits for Success has a chapter on your appearance. He said that much depends on what kind of businesses you are in. If you are out drilling oil wells in Oklahoma, you will need different clothes than if you are running a candy store in Detroit. If you are in an office, dress a little bit better than your fellow employees, but don't dress up so much that you make your boss look like a bum. <clears throat> If you are working at home as a computer programmer or a writer or an artist, you can go naked as long as you don't frighten your cat to death. If you are a man teaching at a high school or college and some of the others wear a coat and tie, then you do too and wear shoes that can be shined and shine them. The instructions are on the shoe polish can. For women, the general guidelines are to avoid too much jewelry, too much perfume, and too much makeup. Imitate your boss's boss. And go easy on the false eyelashes. Professor Eldwood's checklist of personal habits for success listed three keys to success in the chapter, talking, looking, and shaking. When you answer the phone, sound friendly. Don't make it sound like they have called a mortuary. Of course, if you do work in a funeral home, the phone should never ring more than twice. You want to limit their frustration. You are not a government agency. Of course, if you are a government agency, think of yourself as the customer. Do you really enjoy getting one of those phone machines that says you have reached the XYZ company for Spanish press three, for English press four? Our menu has recently changed. Listen carefully and select one of these options. For help in installing our FQ87 model, press 1. For regional matters, press 2. For questions about our model, Z727, press 3. For interlocal, interlocal assistance, press 4. For international orders, press 5. For warranty matters, visit our website at http www forward slash xyz under slash company slash external underscore relations forward slash first under course six underscore days dot com huh. to repeat this menu press star i'm sorry due to unexpectedly high volume response to your call might be delayed your patience is appreciated here is some yodeling cowboy music to keep you entertained until we find someone to answer your call in the looking part of the chapter eldwood talks about eye contact you are not a bowed slave whose eyes are on the ground, nor are you some cow that is looking out the window for entertainment. Look them in the eye without staring. Make them feel they have your total attention, even if you're only making $8 an hour. Whether you are an employee or an employer, you want to project energy. When you walk, head erect, not down, back straight, not slumped, Hands in natural motion, not in your pockets. Walking briskly, you are on the move. In the shaking part of the chapter, Eldwood teaches how to shake hands. If you are a clerk at Harry's Hardware, you won't be shaking hands with customers. But there are situations where a handshake is appropriate. Don't offer just fingers unless you are expecting them to kiss your hand. Don't offer them a dead fish handshake. Pretend like you are still alive. Don't crush their hands with an ultra macho squeeze. Politicians who have to shake a hundred hands 
pretending that they care about each and every voter, dread the idiot who wants to crush their hand into spaghetti. <clears throat> Professor Eldwood's checklist of personal habits for success, most important chapter was entitled Reputation. How you treat your customers does make a big difference. Customers do talk to others. If you make promises, keep them. This in itself will differentiate your business from many others. If you say you are going to do something, then do it, even if it's inconvenient. Who wants to do business with a liar? Don't be late. Being on time announces that you care about them and that you are not pretending to be king or queen of the universe. Exceed what is expected. You are going to give them more and you are going to deliver early. Your reputation is valuable. In fact, it's invaluable. Professor Eldwood's checklist of personal habits for success has a chapter on learning to negotiate. We are negotiating all the time. Two young brothers are arguing who gets to sit in the good chair when they watch television. Or three heirs are trying to decide how to split up the household goods that were left to them. Or two people are talking about getting married. Yes, that involves give and take. She might ask for a well-kissed cheek and a restaurant dinner every week. Having skills in negotiating can mean hundreds of dollars when you buy a car. It can mean thousands of dollars when you buy or sell a house. When you are a little kid, you have few negotiating skills. You say to your sister, do that or I will hit you. Some countries operate on that level. When you are a little older, you learn a bit more. You say to your sister, if you do that for me, I'll give you my Halloween candy. This doesn't work very well in April. In the adult world, there are many key points to learn in making a deal more successful for you. <clears throat> for example, always prepare in advance as much as possible. If you are going to buy a car, research on the internet and talk with friends. Know what you want in a car. Know the prices. For example, the one who is willing to walk away is almost always the one who gets the most in a deal. If the car you are most interested in is on three different car lots, talk with the salesperson on the first lot. Learn everything they are willing to tell you. Enter into talk about the price. Then leave just when things are getting serious. Tell them you need time to consider their offer. Stand up, thank them, and head out the door. It will be, a, it will be tough to do. When you get to the second car lot, you will know a lot more about the real bottom price for that car. If necessary, you can always go back to the first car lot, even though they have told you lies such as this price is only good right now or we might sell the car to someone else if you don't buy it right now. For example, price is only one of the things you include in a negotiation. The other terms of the deal are often just as important. At the very minimum, Read three books on learning how to negotiate. It will be time well spent. There is much to learn.